Genesis chapter 12, please, 12th chapter of Genesis. Jesus lived in a politically charged environment. Religion and politics were very much intertwined in his day. You had people who were Roman collaborators called Herodians on one end of the political spectrum. You had Jewish nationalists who were on the opposite pole. They were called the Zealots or the Sakim by Josephus. Politics permeated the Sanhedrin between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. There were other people who just dropped out of the system altogether, like the Essenes, and became virtual cults. There was an apocalyptic expectation. People were looking for a political messiah who would get rid of the Romans, where the Maccabees had gotten rid of the Greeks 160 years earlier, while the people of Jerusalem were happy to cheer Jerusalem and say, Hosanna, Hosanna, when they thought he was going to be that political messiah. When they found out that was not his purpose in his first coming, those same people were just as quick to yell, crucify him. This idea of looking for a political messiah, a political savior, I've seen that happen repeatedly. And it happens today. It happens in Israel, it happens in the West, it happens in America. Jesus refused to become implicated in the politics of his day, except he said how corrupt it was. He said Herod was a fox, a sneak. And he told people to be aware of political events because of their prophetic importance. That was it. The New Testament tells us we're to pray for those in authority, whether you like them or not. I don't like our politicians. I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. I will pray for whoever gets elected, but I don't trust or respect any party. I think both of them have lost the respect of, of, of anybody who thinks. That's my personal view. You may disagree, and it's OK if you do. But I will pray for whoever gets elected. Even though he's probably a liar and a hypocrite, I'm still going to pray for him. Why? Well, the book of Daniel shows us why. If they're not influenced by our prayers, they'll be influenced by something worse. Barack Obama is not influenced by our prayers, he'll be influenced by something worse. It doesn't matter which party. Jesus didn't get involved in it beyond that. It was prophecy, it was being a good citizen, respecting the position and praying for them, but that was it. He did not attempt to identify his message with either, either party or any party. Today it's different. I've seen it on the left and I've seen it on the right. People who are politically left-wing will define somebody as being, quote-unquote, a good Christian based on their political opinion. Bill Clinton was a perjurer. He was disbarred for perjury in Arkansas. He lied. He was forced to admit he lied. He had no choice. He lied. But because of his politics, there were those who defended him. Oh, he's a good brother. He had preachers like Tony Campolo standing next to him. He had people like Jesse Jackson defending him. But then, of course, Jesse Jackson raised huge amounts of money to help urban blacks in the inner cities of America with his Rainbow Coalition. And he paid a salubrious salary to the mother of a child he fathered out of wedlock to keep her quiet about his son. Paid her off. But that's OK. Because of his politics, he's still a good brother. We redefine morality based on someone's political position. The right wing has done the same thing. The Republicans have done the same thing. Forget the fact what they did and what they are. Same thing. God sees it differently. When you read the Bible, when you read the history of Old Testament Israel, God uses Israel as a microcosm of humanity, of the human condition. If you want to know what people are like, look at Jews. If you want to know what nations are like, look at Israel. If you want to know what governments and politicians are like, read Kings and Chronicles. The histories of other, na of other nations in the ancient world were all embellished. They were all whitewashed. They only talked about their victories, never their defeats. They talked about the virtues of their kings. History was always written by the victor. God was different. 
When God inspired the histories of Israel to be written in Kings and Chronicles, he told the truth. Good kings who made bad mistakes, like Hezekiah or David. Good kings who became bad ones, like Joash. Bad ones who repented, like Manasseh. Good ones who made some unfortunate mistakes, like Asa and Jehoshaphat. Others who were just no good from the word go, like Jeroboam. God never pulled any punches. Israel's defeats were recorded, as well as Israel's victories. They could not whitewash history. God would tell the truth. It's man who whitewashes history. Voltaire was by no means a Christian in any sense of the word. And Voltaire said, history is the lie everybody agrees on. Karl Marx was not a Christian. Karl Marx said, actually, he was the son of a Jewish Christian. Karl Marx said, philosophers have interpreted history in different ways. The idea is to change it. Well, we're told that the, what the Antichrist is going to do is to think, seek to change the times and the law, and they'll be given into his hand for two times, a time and a half time. Think about it. The lordship of history within certain parameters will be given to the hand of Satan and the person of Antichrist for three and a half years. Frightening prospect. But it's going to happen. Mark said that, Voltaire says this. In the New Testament, a Roman official is quoted as asking, what is truth? Jesus, of course, was different. He said, I am the truth. It's amazing. Under the Soviet Union, they had a publication called Pravda, Truth in Russia. Truth was what was defined by the party. The party line was truth. It didn't matter if something was actually true or not. It only mattered what, mattered what the party line was. Pravda. Today, the Western world has gone the same way. Pravda. Truth is whatever is dictated by the party line. It doesn't matter if it's Democrat or Republican. Truth is defined politically. It's not defined, certainly not theologically or biblically or doctrinally. Real truth can only be defined in relation to Christ, who is the truth. It's not actual truth. It's not what really is. It's not defined on the basis of reality. The New Testament calls hypostasis. It's real substance. It's defined on what is politically apt at the moment. That's what truth is. That's what people believe. I suppose unsaved people know a lot about being unsaved people. Those who live in a fallen world, whose citizenship is in a fallen world, understand it. I can understand why they would say things like, it's the lie everybody agrees on. I suppose in some human sense, Voltaire was right. But in an eternal sense, Jesus was right. I agree with everything Bill Koenig says about American presidents and American leaders. But again, Christians who should be reading the Bible are instead reading Pravda. the first president of America, the United States, to betray Israel. It was a Republican. This was the same president who appointed Earl Warren to the Supreme Court. It was a Earl Warren Republican Supreme Court that ordered God out of the classroom and banned prayer in the schools. That was the Republicans. They ordered God out of the classroom. The Republican Party did that. Oh, but they're Christian. It was that same Dwight Eisenhower who appointed Earl Warren. And Eisenhower was not looked upon favorably by a lot of his fellow generals. General MacArthur said Eisenhower was the best clerk he ever had. <laughs> Others denigrated him as simply a politician with stars on his shoulder. Mr. Eisenhower in the, in the Suez crisis in 1956. Forced Israel, Britain, and France to back down against Nasser. He literally took Egypt and most of the Arab world and presented it on a silver platter to the Soviet sphere of influence. That was in 1956, threatening American economic embargoes against our allies, against 
Britain against France and against Israel if they didn't back down and acquiesce to Nasser. That was Eisenhower. Get God out of the classroom. Then, of course, we have President Nixon. Not many years ago, less than 10, the Chicago Sun-Times published the finally released transcript of his conversation with Billy Graham. Both of them notorious anti-Semites. Billy Graham telling Nixon, I had many people who think they're my friends who are Jews, if they only knew what I really thought of them. We've got to stop these Jews. This is Billy Graham, an anti-Semite. From Chicago Sun-Times. Nixon, of course, backed Israel in the Cold War because it was part of the strategy of the Cold War to contain Sovietism. He had to. It was Mr. Nixon. Quite a thing. But he was an anti-Semite. Just read the transcript. It's on the internet. You can read, what, read the conversation between Billy Graham and Nixon. You'll be shocked at how anti-Semitic Billy Graham is. Of course, he apologized, but when it's on the Chicago Sun-Times, you have to. They all have a clergyman with them. Then there was Mr. Reagan. Mr. Reagan had Jerry Falwell. Uh, you know, the same as Barack Obama had Jeremiah Wright, and the same as Bill Clinton had Tony Campola. Well, you know, he had Jerry Falwell. I've got a picture of Jerry Falwell embracing Sun Young Moon, the Korean cult leader of the Unification Church who claims to be the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. And Falwell's calling him an unsung hero. He reported they've given $3.2 million to Liberty University. Well, people tell me Reagan was a Christian. Let's see. It was Mr. Eisenhower's Republican Supreme Court, the Earl Warren Court, that ordered God out of the classroom. Then it was Mr. Nixon's Warren Burger Supreme Court that ordered God out of the maternity ward. Who gave us Roe versus Wade? The Republicans. They gave us a situation that has aborted nearly 50 million babies in this country for no clinical reason. That was the Republicans who gave us Roe versus Wade. That was the Republicans who banned prayer in the schools. That was the Republicans, you know, the Christians. Then we have Mr. Reagan. He promised us, he promised you, he promised me. I didn't never believed him anyway, but uh, most of my friends did. He was pro-life. Never lifted his finger in a pro-life direction. Instead, he appointed Sarah, Sandra Day O'Connor to the Supreme Court, a pro-abortion judge. And so, when a judge puts the Ten Commandments in the Judicial Building in Alabama, which 77% of the American public wanted, 77% of the people wanted it in the Judicial Building, Ronald Reagan's Supreme Court Justice, Sandra Day O'Connor, orders it out. It was the Republicans who kicked God out of the classroom. It was Republicans who kicked God out of the maternity ward. It's the Republicans who kicked God out of the courts. It was the Republicans. You know, the Christians. I'm only stating facts. Republican is nothing but a Democrat who pretends to be a conservative. You look at their record, Republicans are the same as everything a Democrat is, plus a liar on top of it. That's the only that they pretend to be conservatives. Just a liar on top of it. Mr. Reagan quadrupled the national deficit as it was then. It was a record. He was the Obama of his era. People were shocked what he did with the deficits. The way people are shocked now with Obama, they were shocked then what Reagan was doing. Except they said he was a conservative. He quadrupled the deficit. He sold weapons to Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran, then denied it. He had the most corrupt administration in modern history. Mies, Deaver, McFarlane, every one of them was indicted. Every one of them. He ran a corrupt, sleazy administration while his wife was going to Gene Dixon, a fortune teller, giving him her advice as how her husband should run the country. The Word of God calls this in Hebrew, makshafut, witchcraft, witchcraft. The Reagan White House had witchcraft in it, actual witchcraft. The woman is a witch. He was married to a witch. 
And some people say he was more reliant on the advice of his wife than any other president in modern history. A witch. God calls it witchcraft. Oh no, Pravda. Truth is what's politically defined, not factually defined. In 1982, I lived in Israel, and I was on top of Mount Carmel, which is about only 20 to 25 minutes medevac time by helicopter from Beirut. I knew people. I knew even some believers who worked in Rambam Medical Center. At that time, the most experienced facility in the world for battle trauma. When those 282 Marines were blown up after they were deployed in a vulnerable position, I was there when they were being medevac to Israel. Imagine your son, your father, your brother's United States Marine blown up by Muslims, by Hezbollah, and he's 20 minutes from an operating table in Israel. Really good Jewish surgeons. But Robert Reagan picks up the telephone and says, we can't do that. Turn those helicopters around, and your son and your brother arrive right DOA in Wiesbaden, Germany, or in England, at Gloucester. I was there. I saw what Reagan did. I saw what Schultz did. I saw what Weinberger did. I saw them kill those Marines. I was there. can offend the Saudi Arabia. Witchcraft, hyperdeficitism, selling weapons to terrorists, appointing pro-abortion judges to the Supreme Court who ordered the Ten Commandments out of the judicial building. These are Republicans, you know, the Christians. I'm only stating facts. I recall 1991, George Bush Sr. and Mr. Schultz forced Israel out of southern Lebanon. Israel was forced into Lebanon to stop Galilee from getting Katusha rockets. The Israelis withdrew. Mr. Bush and Mr. Uh, Baker, James Baker, gave Lebanon on a silver platter to Syria. We're in bed with Iran. That same land was used again to nearly kill my son in 2006, nearly kill my wife's parents in 2006. That was land for peace. That was Bush's land for peace. And as Bill Riley pointed out, George W. Bush, his son, had land for peace in Gaza. The next day, the very next day, Gaza was used to shell Sparot in the suburbs of Tel Aviv, Ashkelon. That's the Bush land for peace. My sister's husband was murdered by the Muslims in the World Trade Center. As a loyal American, I ask myself a question. What kind of president would continue to give express visas to Saudi Arabians for a full year after September 11th when 16 of the 18 hijackers were Saudi Arabian. Would you give visas to kamikaze pilots after Pearl Harbor? What kind of a president would do that? I can tell you what kind of a president would do that. I can tell you what kind of a president did do that, a Republican. You know better than I do. What kind of a president would refuse, would refuse to protect the nation's border in a time of war? Well, you know what kind of president refuses to protect this country's border in a time of war? A Republican, a Texas Republican. You know, the born-again patriot ones. I'm only stating facts. Yes, Obama is a wicked man. He's the spirit of Antichrist. But we need to pray for him, because as bad as he is, if we don't, he's going to be worse. Don't tell me a Bush is any better or a Republican is a lesser of evils. They are not. 
It is all a media con. It's all manipulated. Ronald Reagan was a grade B Hollywood actor hired by the Republican Party establishment to play the role of a conservative. Political strategists by Karl Rove tell them how to manipulate naive, undiscerning, born-again Christians to vote for them thinking they're Christians. They say one thing with their words and other things with their actions. This is reality. There is no political salvation. Not until Jesus reigns on the throne of David, not until the government is on his shoulder will I trust anybody in political power, but I'll pray for them. The Republican Party makes me sick. They are vomit-provoking. They are nauseating. I hate the Republican Party just as much as I hate the Democrat Party. I detest the Bush as much as I detest an Obama. But I'll pray for whoever gets elected. So should you. They don't deserve our prayers, but they need our prayers that we may live as peaceful life as possible in this fallen world until Jesus comes. It's all a con. It's all a lie. The world is in the power of the wicked one. It was the Republicans who kicked God out of the classroom. It was the Republicans who kicked God out of the maternity ward. It's the Republicans who kicked God out of the courts. It's the Republicans. They're no friends of us. They're all owned and operated by international corporations and banks and they're all in bed with the Saudis who hate us. It's all a pack of lies. Believe and trust none of them. But pray for every one of them. The Bible tells you the truth. It's all corrupt. Read the book of Daniel. It's all corrupt. The religious right. We should call it the religious wrong. Can you imagine me saying to 700 saved Christians, give me $10 a month, we're going to build a Christian network of television stations to preach the gospel of Jesus. Begun with 700 people giving 10 bucks a month. It grows and grows and grows. Then I sell it to Rupert Murdoch and put $900 million in my pocket, finagling it legally and financially to pull it off. That is what Pat Robertson did. It is a matter of public record. I'm only stating the facts. There's no religious right. There is only a religious wrong. If you don't want people to like you, tell them a lie. If you want them to hate your guts, tell them the truth. Pravda. The New York Times, CNN, the BBC. You can't believe these things. You can't believe anything. If you really want to know what's going on, there's only one thing to read that's going to tell you not only what is happening, but why it's happening and what is going to happen. That's this book. Read all the rest of the media in light of this book. Pray for whoever gets elected, but don't trust or believe any of them. They are liars. They are hypocrites. They are murderers. They have no loyalty to anything. Politicians only care about two things. The next election and not getting caught. Even if somebody was personally honest, the system is so corrupt, it would corrupt them. Nations get the leaders they deserve. The reason we have had nothing but scum in the White House is because we've had little but scum in the pulpit. Do you know what unsaved people think when they turn on the TV and see a televangelist prostituting the Word of God, corrupting the Word of God? Corrupting the gospel to line their own pockets? If that's the state of the church, what do you expect from the state of the nation? 
the decline we see in America and the decline we see of the Western world, it is not primarily the fault of crooked politicians in Washington or corrupt bankers on Wall Street or pornographers in Hollywood or whatever. It is primarily the fault of the church that is no longer salt and light. If we were salt and light, this would not be happening to America. This would not be happening to the Western world. The indictment is ours. The Lord never called crooked politicians to be salt and light. Jesus knew what those people were. He called us to be salt and light. Read with me, please, to Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, from your relative, your father's house, to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And you, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed, as Brother Bill pointed out. Five promises. A great name. A land. That all nations, all peoples will be blessed through him because the Messiah would come through him. God would bless those who bless him, curse those who curse him, and his descendants. And these promises are reiterated through Isaac and Jacob. Islam claims they go through Esau and Ishmael. Understand, Islam teaches that Judas died on the cross. It's not Jesus. Islam teaches that Jesus was only a prophet inferior to Muhammad and that God has no son. First John tells us, as I said last night, that that which denies the father-son relationship is antichrist. So the Texas Christian Republican George Bush, after September 11th, in order to honor a religion that says God has no son, takes a copy of that book that says God has no son and puts it in the White House to honor Islam after September 11th. That's what he did. And he's a good Christian. You shouldn't be critical of your brother. You should read Pravda instead of the Bible. I don't read Pravda. I read the Bible. Koran says, Allah is not begotten, neither does he beget. God has no son. The New Testament says that makes it antichrist. Some have tried to say this is the Old Testament. It has no further validity. What do you do with the fact that the promises to Israel are reiterated in the New Testament? I had one person claim that people like me were hyper-literalists. He's an Anglican. He claims to be born again, but he's in a church that is in England ordaining homosexuals and lesbians. He doesn't seem to have any problem with that. He has a problem with Israel. A hyper-literalist, theologically, is somebody who literally believes that the trees of the field will clap their hands, the trees are going to grow hemp. That's what a hyper-literalist is. In other words, to him, somebody who takes the word of God literally is a hyper-literalist. You're supposed to allegorize it. You're supposed to spiritualize it. In other words, he's what's known theologically as a Gnostic. Every time they see Israel, that's the church. They spiritualize the text out of context. This is Gnosticism. Pure mysticism. They have no exegetical basis for doing it, but that's their hermeneutic. I know what Voltaire said. I know what Marx said. I also know what Goebbels, Hitler's propaganda minister, said. If you tell a lie often enough, people will believe it's the truth. Fox News is less biased than CNN. Everybody knows that. But they tell the lie often enough. Reagan was a conservative. People will believe it. The fact that he quadrupled the deficit, the fact that he sold weapons to Ayatollah Khomeini, <laughs> the fact that he appointed a pro-abortion judge after promising he was pro-life. Oh, he's a conservative. When he was governor of California, he tripled the state taxes in California, and he set the stage for the tax revolt. He was nothing, there was never anything conservative about him. He was a Republican. You can't be a Republican and a conservative if you really look at the realities. Republican is one thing, a conservative is another. 
Oh, but he was a conservative. Who said so? Pravda? That's what people choose to believe. If you tell the lie often enough, people will think it's the truth. The Bible doesn't play those games. The Bible just tells the truth for what it is. The lie being told is Palestine. It was again the Bush family, partners in the Carlisle group with the Saudi Arabian, the House of Saud, that beheads people if you become a Christian. Who George H. Bush said, or our friends, well, somebody who beheads somebody for accepting Christ may be a friend of Bush, but he's no friend of mine. I personally wish the Bush family would get on an airplane and go back to Saudi Arabia where they belong. Beheading Christians. They're our friends. And it was his son who was the first president to call for a two-state solution, a Palestinian state. A Palestinian state, let's begin with the lie you tell often enough when people believe it, Palestine. Palestine simply comes from the Latin, Palestinian, the Latinization of the biblical term Philistine, from Philistia. The Philistines were not Arabs. The Philistines were Indo-Grecian Europeans from Crete. They worshipped the fish god Dagon. An ethnic Palestinian has not existed in 2,500 years. Anthropologically and ethnically, genetically, there is no such thing as a Palestinian. They've not existed in two and a half thousand years. These people calling themselves that are Arabs. Yasser Arafat was born in Egypt. He was educated in Egypt. He served in the Egyptian army. You had Arab absentee landlords who lived in other countries, but most of the people today calling themselves Palestinians are descendants of Arabs, Muslims, who immigrated illegally under the British and the Turks in places like Tunisia. A Palestinian hasn't existed in two and a half thousand years. That's Palestinian. Anthropologically, there is no such thing as a Palestinian. Geographically, Palestine was the name that the Romans in the second century gave for the land between the Mediterranean and the Jordan. But that kind of Palestinian referred to somebody as a Palestinian based on where they live. If you lived between the Mediterranean and the Jordan, you were Palestinian. The first name of the Jerusalem Post, the English-speaking newspaper of Israel, its original name, the Palestinian Post. The original name of the Israeli National Philharmonic Orchestra, the Palestinian Philharmonic Orchestra, <laughs> except all the musicians were Jews. In the Second World War, the Palestinian Legion of the British Army Approximately 31, 32,000 British soldiers from Palestine. Every one of them a Jew. <laughs> a Palestinian could be an Arab, a Jew, a Christian, a Jews. Could be anybody as long as they lived there. It was a geographical definition. So as an anthropological definition, there's no such thing. As a geographical definition, there is a such thing, but it's nothing to do with ethnicity. The third is the theological definition. This speaks of the theology that came from that region between the Mediterranean and the Jordan. The most famous author, theological author, an academic theologian, was the scholar E.P. Sanders. 
He wrote the classics Christ and Palestinian Judaism, Torah and Palestinian Judaism. Out of Palestine came Jewish theology and Christian theology. No Islamic theology ever came from Palestine. Islamic theology came from Arabia and from Egypt. As a theological term, it's Jewish and Christian. It's Judeo-Christian. It's not Islamic. As a geographical term, it's multi-ethnic. In fact, it's polyethnic. It's non-ethnic. It's purely who lives there. Anthropologically, there hasn't been a Palestinian in two and a half thousand years. In fact, closer to 3,000 years. Yet, we're taught Palestine, Palestinian. Tell the lie enough, people will believe it. They get to a crusade if they'll believe it. The United Nations says it, they'll believe it. The only thing Palestinians of today, as they call themselves, seem to have to do with Palestinians of the ancient world as they both sacrificed their children. That's the only connection I can see between them. Look with me again to Genesis, please. We were told that when Abraham came to the land that God showed him, he comes to this land, God promises it to him at a place called Elon Moray. And we're told that at this particular time, the Canaanite was also in the land. Notice Abraham was there from the time of the Canaanites. Another people that no longer exist, wiped out by Joshua, etc. A wicked, wicked people, there was a curse on them in the book of Genesis. They practiced human sacrifice, they practiced ritual bestiality. So, Abraham was the other indigenous people. The Hebrews, what became known as the Israelites. The Canaanites are gone. Now the Israelites are the only other indigenous people there, according to the biblical record. The Israelites. This goes on for some time until the Assyrian captivity. We're talking about 721 BC. We have the Assyrians, the 10 northern tribes, are conquered by the Assyrians. But the Assyrian Empire collapses. And the land is re-inhabited by a combination of Israelites and Samaritans, who are a mixture of Jewish and Assyrian. Still exists today. Then we get to 721, 722 BC. The Babylonian captivity comes. As Daniel prophesied, the Babylonians are toppled by the Media Persians. Cyrus and Darius send the Jews back. The Israelites. Then Alexander the Great invades the Middle East, takes over the Persian Empire. His descendants quarrel. He dies at the age of 36, and his empire is divided before two, be, be, between four of his generals, the two most important being Ptolemy, who gets Egypt and southern Israel. 
uh, and the Seleucids who get the north. Seleucus and his descendants who get the north, Galilee and Lebanon and so forth. These become the Seleucids. They are Greeks. Under the Maccabee Revolt, predicted also by Daniel and celebrated by Jesus in John chapter 10, the Israelites liberate the land. This goes on to the time of Pompey. The Jews stupidly make a deal with the Romans. Pompey enters the Holy of Holies, a major type of the Antichrist. If you don't understand it, you'll never understand the Antichrist. Whenever you see somebody other than the high priest on the Day of Atonement, or the Lord Jesus himself, entering the Holy of Holies, it's a type of the Antichrist. You understand? Entering the holy place, the, the, the Shikutsa Meshomen, we call it in Aramaic, the abomination of desolation. Pompey enters it after he makes a treaty with the Jews and breaks it. The way Pompey made a treaty with the Jews and broke it into the Holy of Holies is a major foreshadowing of what's going to happen with the Antichrist. Romans are here. First Jewish revolt. 68 AD. Israelites get it back. As predicted by Daniel and Jesus, having rejected their Messiah, the Israelites are under God's judgment. The Romans get it. Second Jewish revolt under Bar Kokhba, alluded to prophetically by Jesus in John 5. If another comes in his own name, him you will believe. Circa 120 AD, the Israelites. So it goes, this is the Hasmonean period, Roman period, the first revolt, the Romans get it again. Second Jewish revolt, but then it's the Romans. The eastern half of the Roman Empire is Greek speaking. To do more of the politics of Europe and the Middle East, this becomes the Byzantians. Now the church comes under God's judgment for its idolatry, its icon veneration, its transubstantiation, etc. Islam becomes God's vehicle of judging the church. In the Old Testament, God used heathen nations to judge Israel, to make them repent. Today, Islam is God's judgment on Israel and on the Western Judeo-Christian world. What does God do? He raises up someone worse than you as his instrument of judgment. I agree with what Bill said. George Bush provoked September 11th in the divine economy. It was a judgment because of what the Bush family did to this country. Remember, in Texas at election time, they're all born again, but they go home at night and they pray to an oil well. Northern Ireland is very similar. They're all good evangelical Protestants at election time. What is? Well, same kind of thing was happening then. Byzantians. But then God's judgment comes in the form of Islam. The Arabs get it, but they don't last too long. They're only there for a hot minute. Turks who adopted Islam conquer the Arabs and enslave them. To this day, Turks don't like Arabs. They look down on them, as they do on Kurds. The banking families of Italy in the Middle Ages vied to get their man in the papacy to be pope. The papal court was a brokerage house of international banking. The spice trade for the Middle East was revolutionizing the economy of the Western world. The same as the economy of the Western world is beholden to a degree that should not be to Middle East oil today. In the Dark Ages, it was spices from the Middle East. Spices could make food taste better and last longer. To control the spice trade, 
not to make it a religious crusade, but it was only part religious. It was more economic to do with the spice trade. This was the Crusades, the Holy Latin Kingdom, Europeans, people from England, France, Italy, and Germany. Finally, Salah Hadin defeats the Crusades at the hordes of Hattin, and it becomes the Ottomans. Until World War I. Then comes General Allenby. There's also the Mamelukes, but they were not too significant in the duration. The British. Israel winds up with 21% of the land that was promised by the Bellflower Declaration. They only got 21% of what was promised. And they wouldn't have got that had it not been for the Holocaust. Now understand something. The rabbis condemned Zionism. They condemned Herzl. They condemned the followers, a founders of Zionism. It was secular Jewish socialists. They saw the failure of communism in Russia, so they wanted to make a form of socialism that would be democratic and that would work based on a Jewish model that would be lights to other nations politically. These were the Zionists. They began the kibbutzes and the moshavs, people like Ben-Gurion and so forth. They were condemned by the rabbis. The rabbis opposed Zionism. If the rabbis had their way, there'd be no Israel today. But now that there is an Israel, despite them, they want to control it. They're just as hypocritical as the World Council of Churches. The Israelites are back, as the scriptures predicted, as Jesus predicted. Now, notice two things. No matter who had it, it always went back to the indigenous people. No matter who had it or how long they had it, the land always reverted back to the Israelites. Always. Second thing. It was an Assyrian colony a Babylonian colony, a Greek colony, a Roman colony, a Byzantine colony, a Turkish colony, a European colony, a British colony. They called it protectorates or mandates or different things, but they're just colonies. The only sovereign nation that has ever been there since Abraham, the only sovereign independent nation that has ever been there is Palestine. There has never been a Palestine. There's never been any such place. It has never existed. There's never been such a nation. From the time of Abraham, the only sovereign, independent nation that has ever existed there has been Israel. Anything else was just a colony of some other foreign power. And there's never been a Palestine. Never! Let's go back to 1967. Then the Cold War was basically a sideshow. I'm sorry, the war, conflict in the Middle East was a sideshow of the Cold War. In World War I with Allenby, the Middle East with Lawrence of Arabia and all that stuff was a sideshow of the First World War in Europe. Up to 1967, it was a sideshow of the Cold War. In fact, until 1973 and so forth. Now it becomes focal. If an Arab who lived on the West Bank tried to say he was a Palestinian, the Jordanians would have hung him immediately. In 1968, King Hussein of Jordan, who I met in Williamsburg, Virginia, when I was 15 years old. In 1968, King Hussein of Jordan said, Jordan is Palestine, Palestine is 
Jordan. Jordan is 70% Palestinian Arab, 30% Hashemite Bedouin from Saudi Arabia. Who separates Palestine? The Jordanians. In 1970, Yasser Arafat said, Jordan is Palestine. Palestine is Jordan. There is a Palestinian state, according to Yasser Arafat. It's called Jordan. Only when Arafat tried to take over Jordan in 1970, when he tried on his fellow Muslims what he would later try on the Israelis. In 12 days, September of 1970, 12 days for a black September, the British trained and armed Jordanian Legion systematically exterminated between 15 and 18,000 Palestinians in 12 days. It's a lot more than the Israelis ever killed. Do you understand the lie? The suffering of the Palestinian people. They admit they have a state called Jordan. Arafat admitted it. The Jordanians admitted it. Before the House of Saud came to power in Saudi Arabia, with the blessings of Franklin Roosevelt and co, the original king, Musharraf, said, Jerusalem and Israel are for the Jews. That's what the Arabians said. Before the Ba'ath party of Iraq, Saddam Hussein's party, overthrew the regime, King Faisal of Iraq said, Israel is for the Jews. They said this themselves. The Bedouins, the real indigenous Arabs, the ones who were always there, they supported Zionism because it increased their standard of living. To this day, there are thousands and thousands of Bedouins serving voluntarily in the Israeli army. There are thousands of Druzes serving voluntarily in the Israeli army. And there are thousands of Arab Christians serving voluntarily in the Israeli army at any one time up to 20,000. The Druzes say, we don't want to live under the Muslims. The Bedouins say, we don't want to live under the other Arabs. The Christians say, you know what they do to Christians in Muslim countries? <laughs> they don't tell you this. Jesse Jackson doesn't tell you this. That Aminapur, whatever her name is on CNN, doesn't tell you this. Jim Clancy doesn't tell you this. Thousands. According to the World Health Organization of the United Nations, better called the United Nothing. Now understand the United Nothing. I used to live across the street from the United Nothing on First Avenue in Manhattan before I immigrated to Israel. You could tell the vehicles of the UN diplomats because they had a seal that allowed them, and they had diplomatic license plates and a seal and usually a flag on the antenna from whatever country they were from because they could park in certain places other people couldn't park. I mean stretch limousines. I mean Rolls Royce, Mercedes Benz, Lincoln Continental. From countries with astronomical infant mortality and unbelievable, unbelievable poverty. These guys are living like kings, coming from countries where people are dying of starvation so they can go into the UN and denounce Western imperialism. When the Chinese Communist government killed between seven and 8,000 people at Tiananmen Square, it was witnessed by 1.2 billion people on television. They deny it officially. 1.2 thousand people said, oh, it'll never happen. How many UN revolutions passed against China? None. 
in Rwanda open genocide. What did the UN do? Nothing. Sudan, massacre of Christians, what did the UN do? Nothing. Try to get a resolution passed against terror, UN won't do it. 52 Muslim countries won't sign. How many UN resolutions, both Security Council and General Assembly, passed against Israel? Approximately 50%. As Bill pointed out, the idea that Israel is the culprit. If Israel didn't exist, we would still have 300,000 murdered Christians in East Timor killed by the Muslims. We would still have 80,000 Christians in the southern Philippines killed by the Moslems. We would still have 30,000 Christians in the Moluccan Islands killed by the Muslims. We'd still have 40,000 Christians in Somalia and Eritrea killed by the Muslims. We'd still have, since 1968, over 1 million Christians in northern Nigeria killed by the Muslims. We would still have 3.4 million Christians approximately in Sudan in the last 14 years killed by the Muslims. If Israel didn't exist, we'd solve the same problem. But blame it on Israel, it's simple. Ishmael's seed will always be divided. Esau's sword will be against his brother. There's a curse on those people unless they accept Christ. They won't tell you that. The only basis of Muslim unity is a common enemy. Otherwise, they'll kill each other. Look what they do in Iraq. Look what they do in Afghanistan. Look what they did in Yemen. If they cannot kill Jews, if they cannot kill Christians, they will kill each other. Esau's sword will be against his brother. Ishmael's seed will always be divided. There is no ummah, no unity, as the Quran says. We have tapes explaining this. But let's understand this further. According to the UN, the standard of living, and I mean infant mortality, longevity, employment, the essentials of life, improved in Gaza 370% before the first intifada under the Israelis. Compared to what it was under the Egyptians, 370% improvement. The standard of living in the West Bank under the Israelis, 320% improvement, said the UN, before the Intifada. They never had it so good. We're told it's apartheid. Apartheid. Apartheid was a South African term for what the American South called segregation. I remember in my youth driving through the southern states with my parents on the way to Florida in the summertime. And I remember signs, this is Klan country. And uh, white only. I remember that stuff. Coming from New York as a kid, it was all strange to me. I never saw this before. I couldn't understand it at the time. I was a little kid. But I remember it. I remember young people coming back from Vietnam who were black could not attend university in Alabama or Mississippi simply because they were black after they fought for the country. I remember what Jim Crow was like under apartheid. Except in Israel, 22% of the students attending university for free are Arab. They have a vote. They have a democracy. Apartheid? If you want apartheid, go to Saudi Arabia. They have apartheid. You want apartheid, go to Iran. They have apartheid. You want apartheid, go to Malaysia. A Chinese person can't go to university unless their parents have the money to send them to Australia or America. Based on race and based on Islam. The real apartheid is Muslim. There's no apartheid in Islam. If there was one man who understood apartheid, that is segregation, he was a Baptist preacher from America. He said, not long before he died, he wrote, make no mistake, anti-Zionism is but anti-Semitism. I'm quoting Dr. Martin Luther King. He knew what apartheid was. And he knew what anti-Semitism was. Who do I believe? 
believe Jesse Jackson or Martin Luther King? One of them's a liar. From May 1948 until June 1967. East Jerusalem, the West Bank, Gaza, were all in the possession of Arab Muslims. They could have done anything they wanted from May 1948 until June 1967. They had East Jerusalem. They had the Golan Heights. They had Gaza. They could have done anything they wanted. If they wanted a second Palestinian Muslim state, in addition to the one that they themselves said already existed in Jordan, in addition to the one that Arafat said existed in Jordan, if they wanted a second Arab-Palestinian Muslim state, why didn't they just establish one when they had nearly 20 years to do it? They had 20 years to do it. But they saw no need to do any such thing except wage jihad against Israel and against the West. You know what they say in Arabic? CNN doesn't like to translate it. First the Saturday people, then the Sunday people. First we'll murder the Jews, then we'll murder the Christians. Why not? Bush will give them a visa to do it. They say they had 20 years to do it. Their standard of living increased, but we're talking the suffering of the Palestinian people. Arafat, the Palestinian Authority, formerly called Fatah. They pilfered, they looted, they extorted, they embezzled hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and euros given to build an infrastructure in Gaza. They stole the money. Whose fault is this that Arafat's people stole the money? That's why the people in part turned to Hamas. Because Arafat ripped them off. Who's first that the Arafat stole the money instead of building schools and hospitals and roads, creating jobs? Oh, it's Israel's fault. Israel, under whose rule their standard of living increased by more than threefold. It's Israel's fault. When Israel was there, their standard of living went up astronomically. Once Israel left, it went back to its old Muslim ways. I've been to Muslim countries from Malaysia to the Persian Gulf to Morocco. Every one of them is a stinking sewer. It doesn't matter how much money or oil left they have, every one of them is a stinking sewer. They'll show you the skyscrapers in Dubai. I'll show you another side of Dubai. People from Pakistan getting paid 80, 90 cents an hour for working a 14 hour day living under a bridge. <laughs> Every one of them is a stinking sewer. The injustice is Israel's fault. But you tell the lie often enough, people will think it's the truth. Pravda, tell the lie. The United Nations tells the lie. George Bush tells the lie. Candelisa Rice tells the lie. Barack Obama tells the lie. Tony Blair tells the lie. CNN tells the lie. BBC tells the lie. Why shouldn't they? They're all children of the father of lies. The world is in the power of the wicked. They can believe the lie in fact, 
they're probably given over in divine judgment to believe the lie themselves. They choose to believe the lie. If somebody chooses to believe a lie, it destroys them. An alcoholic can keep abusing alcohol and think he's going to pull through. What about what you're doing to your liver and your brain? A heroin addict, what's he doing to himself? When I was in university, I was addicted to cocaine. I believed the lie. What was I doing to myself? By the grace of God, I stopped believing the lie because and only because I got saved. Only because I got saved. Either God opens your eyes and you stop believing the lie, or the lie will consume you. The world is being consumed by a lie. And the biggest lie is yet to come. The Antichrist will bring a false peace. Having said that, it's not the lie that's coming that concerns me the most. It's the truth that's coming that concerns me the most. Let the world be consumed by the lie. By the grace of God, we can be consumed by the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. He said, I am truth. Father, sanctify them in the truth. For thy word is truth. You want the truth? Turn off CNN. You want the truth? Pray for the bankruptcy of the New York Times. You want the truth? Pray that God raises up leaders instead of politicians. You want the truth? Get your doctrine from Scripture instead of from a televangelist con artist. You want the truth? No problem. Here it is. God bless.